Great, fantastic. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, in this session, we're gonna be talking about um, API productization. Uh, very specifically, we're gonna have a, we're gonna introduce a structured way of thinking for putting together an API portfolio and an architectural approach to commercially governing it. So a little bit about me, my name is Esra. I am the founder of Pricing Innovations. Uh, we are a product strategy firm uh, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we focus on pricing amortization of uh, technology products, services, platforms, uh, you name it. So we've been around for about 10 years now, and even in the last 10 years, we've seen three distinct eras of where the product is going. In our work in pricing, of course, we have the privilege of working on where the puck is going. Whenever you know, the technology is changing, uh, that's what we get to work on. So even in the short 10 years, we saw product change into platform, change into ecosystem. And here's what I mean by that. So 10 years ago, you know, we started the tail end of SaaS. These were core functional products. The focus was uh, product market fit and feature differentiation. The competition went on like feature by feature and we were calculating the economic value based on the differentiation and whatever. Um, and then there was very little um, you know, verticalization. It was all functional core products. Then these product solutions started to solve a, for a larger scope within the business, and this was the era of land and expand. So a lot of these solutions uh, started to uh, create additional uh, products to solve for the entire lines of businesses. This is when interoperability and integrations became really important, and products started to go to market as portfolios. Um, a lot of the product companies were seeking like enterprise models and then those enterprise contracts got super big and then they went to product led and it was like all over the place and we were starting to see some new revenue models emerge. This is also when the new partnership and channel models emerged because these scopes got really large so the deployment and implementation be became really key. So now the competition 3.0 is a whole different thing. It is ecosystem versus ecosystem. Network as a platform is the key way of playing in the market. Out of the box connectivity is expected. Your partners are significantly closer to the end customer, so they are creating the last mile solutions. Uh, they're based on the orchestration on your platform components. And a lot of the competition is based on these uh, components. The um, partners are also seeking to embed their own components and everything is somehow getting smaller. So not only platforms are uh, playing with their components, meaning you know, composite services, extensions, applications, multi-step processing, composable components of their own platform and technology, their data assets, other digital assets, that's where the game is moving. And in some cases, as we heard from Z, these components are replacing software, and in some cases, they are even replacing platforms. So we do an annual benchmarking study every year, and this year, that's what we looked at. We looked at how these components are being productized since APIs are the building blocks and powering engine behind these. That was the question, like how are these being, pr being productized? How, how are they being monetized? Well, the thing about API monetization is that it has to be a commercial offering. Like a few years ago when we were engaged with platforms, it was like, well, can you help us with this API monetization? They just expected us to throw a number at them per an API call. So we're glad that is changing and there's maturity around this, but there is not enough commercial governance maturity around this. So a lot of the pl platforms have individual API products, web services, web hooks are still pretty prevalent. Um, they uh, pr uh, present them as like access-based uh, entitlements at higher tiers, sometimes with subscription, their platform uh, layers, data services, analytics packs, um, cloud extensions, um, connectors and integrations are still a thing. Um, 1P applications, third-party applications, developer tooling and services that are enticing the use of their services, all of these things um, exist out there. But the problem is, it's everything, everywhere, all at once. And there is not enough commercial governance around this. The, the way the experience of this feels like, going into a supermarket where there are no aisles, no shelves, no signs, and all the products are right in front of you. So, you know, you're looking for a snack, you can get a banana, you can get a cup of soup, you can get ice cream, you can get popcorn, 
You can get cheese and crackers, candy, whatever. Like imagine all of these just being lumped right in front of you, no price discrimination, and everything is in front of you. Now imagine this supermarket started their business as a popcorn seller, and they started to sell popcorn by the kernel. That didn't work, and then they started to pack it like 1,000 at a time, 10,000 at a time, 100,000 at a time, and now they're trying to apply that pricing model to bananas and a cup of soup. That's what an API service call is. Exactly works the same way. And now imagine the cost of keeping the soup warm and ice cream cold next to one another. That's what's going on with our API portfolios. Why does this matter? Uh, my good friend Kristen here, don't miss her talk tomorrow, uh, she was here last year speaking about uh, consistency in developer experience. Well, consistency in user experience, buyer experience, uh, with in while, while interacting with commercial uh, API portfolios is very similar. Platforms can drive 10 to 15 percent, even higher, of their revenues from their components and API-powered digital assets, but only if they have a commercial governance around it, and only if they can enforce these commercial terms and commercial governance for their, for their products. So we have a way to offer to, to think about this. So just going with the analogy of the supermarket, here we have the aisles and the shelves and the products, right? So the way that we think about this in terms of uh, wayfinding in API portfolios, uh, so we have layers and we have categories and then we have uh, products. And the way we look at this is by their purpose and they, they, how the, de the value they deliver relate to one another. Because we, in, in pricing and monetization, price discrimination is a positive thing. You actually want to categorize things to signal their relative value to one another. So in, for when, when it comes to APIs, we think of these as three distinct layers. One of capability, which takes your technology further with developers. It helps you productize and monetize your digital assets, your technology that you build with your platform. The other one, connectivity layer, takes your, takes your technology further with your uh, ISV partners, with other solutions that you integrate with. And the extensibility layer takes your technology much further with customers through applications and automations and workflow and multi-step processing. So what might the categories on these layers look like? Um, so in the ca capability layer, at the platform la layer, you have API products, composite services, orchestration tools, uh, portal, the API portal service management, or AI, ML agents, and, and products. So you folks work on API definitions all day long. So this is about definitions. So an API product and an API service are not the same thing. Like uh, Edgar talked about Expedia. When you call Expedia or geolocation or uh, weather data types of things, those are services. You call a service, you consume it Im immediately. But when you are connected, connected to an IoT, uh, a I IoT API, streaming the IoT data, or change data capture, for example, where you're periodically or in bulk getting the changes in, in your so uh, partner software, that is a product. Uh, similarly, a composite service that uh, serves multi-step data, multi-step processing of data, is not the same as just a one um, data endpoint. So we need to think of this in a value hierarchy. That's why category management exists in retail. That's why the retail perfected it over decades, and we need to think about it similarly. When you think about your connectivity layer, not every connector is built equal either. And the way that you signal value in your connectors is by defining what a standard connector is. If you define your standard connector as a two-way sync of your customer's data, let's say sales transactions data, with a standard set of instrumentation, a standard level of customization, then what you define next to it Let's say, let's call it advanced connectors. Naming convention here is irrelevant. You can call it whatever you want. The point is to create the value hierarchy. So let's say an advanced connector uh, uh, serves you multi-domain data, like sales, customer, inventory, data together, right? So that's multi-domain. It's deeper and more granular, and it's a different level of connecting with a partner. On top of that, let's add the accounting data on top of it, where your proprietary data model serves a detailed accounting report, like or a sales forecast or whatever. That is a process 
connector because that has enriched or, or processed uh, data that serves you. And then there are aggregate connectors that connect you to Zapier's of the world or unified AI platforms that connect you with you know, hundreds and thousands of customers. The point is how you define the first one gives you an ability to differentiate between these products and signal their value in relation to one another. Now, your connectivity layer is your commitment to stay an open platform. I am not saying or advising that everything is monetizable, put a price tag on everything. Connectivity layer is your way to uh, you know, work with your partners in the way that uh, you, you want and you want to drive, right? So it really helps you to have uh, the meaningful relationships and the growth behaviors with your partners. So you don't have to monetize everything, but even giving the different levels of access to your platform and data um, in these, you know, with a value hierarchy makes you a better partner and brings better partners and better partner behaviors to, to the table. Uh, same thing with apps. I won't repeat myself. You can look at apps by type of data operation, where the data operation is taking place, whose server servers they're taking place. Are they horizontal apps? Are they vertical apps? Um, what level of UX layer is wrapped around these applications? So you can create value hierarchy and pricing differentiation uh, by looking at apps that way. The key here is to do it, to create a commercial governance that signals and that, that puts together layers by purpose of what these APIs are doing and creates categories by value and groups products by similar type of uh, value and, and um, use case. One last call. When you do this, you actually don't have to work too hard on your monetization model because it's already lined up for you. The capability layer lines up very well with developers and the uh, scale factor there is um, levels of access and usage. The connectivity layer lines up with your ISV partners. The scale factor is number of connected accounts. The larger partner with whom you share a larger customer base can get more privileges and entitlements, of course, why not? because you're driving co-innovation together. And then on the apps, the uh, scale factor, of course, is revenue share. And the, the trick about apps is that customers' willingness to pay for apps is significantly larger than for connectors and integrations. They're kind of becoming um, largely uh, commoditized because it's expected, right? So just by limiting the scope of what a connector is, you actually are creating an opportunity to define what an application is and how an application works differently than just, a, just an integration. So again, my point is to really create these definitions and to have a commercial governance architecture to go with your API portfolio. Oh, that was very fast. I hope, I hope it wasn't too fast, uh, but it, uploading the slides here. So I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but if any of this is interesting to you, please find me. We, in our benchmarking document, we have great examples of who's doing this best, who's you know, doing this better, and some uh, good screenshots of what these companies and others are doing uh, in terms of these types of commercial governance. All right, so let's say you, are, you have a nice externalization strategy, you decided what to productize, you have set a commercial governance architecture around that portfolio, and you even mapped your APIs, your layers, categories, and products. Now what? Well, the biggest challenge that we face in, uh, with clients is that as soon as they do this, they get immense pushback from business. Because what happens is that as soon as you start attributing revenue to API-powered products, you're almost taking away revenue from, from the business, which is used to sell products and solutions and services, and that is a nice PNL that is growing, right? Well, the, when you implement uh, a, a commercial governance model for components, your revenue attribution and your revenue tracking needs to mimic that. You need to track and attribute your API-powered products revenue in a different way. So the way that we look at it is what we created a, um, and what we call is a contributor revenue model. So in this revenue model or in this revenue tracking, there are four revenue streams, direct, source, transactional, and services. And under these, there are more than 60 commercial activities you can take place. So the way that you would build this way of tracking is that you would decide which commercial activities you will take part in, and then uh, highlight which ones ha APIs have contribution to, like revenue contribution to. Um, and then the, 
And then like, the question becomes, well, what metric, which metric do we use best? The one that we had most success with, success with is NRR, net uh, revenue retention. Net revenue retention measures incremental, the additional revenue from APIs from existing customers. And that way, you actually might be able to work really well with the business so that a API uh, attribution or contribution to the revenue um, can be tracked uh, in a fair way and a bit more transparently. It's not only about tracking, right? It's also how you will drive growth in these. Unless you have a commercial governance and unless you have a contributor revenue model, it's really difficult to drive growth from these individual products in your portfolio. So uh, this makes it one step easier and closer. Okay, one last thought here. Let's say you did all this. It's not really easy to make a leap from product thinking into ecosystem and component thinking. We find that to be the hardest thing. We spent more than 20 years to establish product culture in our technology uh, companies and in our technology teams. And now we're asking them to think about driving value not for the customer, but for the partners. That's a very tough pill to swallow, but that's what it takes to be in the ecosystem economy and in the component economy. When you do that, the value of your ecosystem can be as much as 10x of your own technology. That's stickiness, my friends. That's retention and that's growth because your partners are taking an active part in growing your customer's investment in your technology and tooling. But that requires a fully embedded partner ops in everything, in product, in sales, in R&D, in uh, delivery, in customer support, customer success, uh, you name it. Uh, you need to work with partners. And again, that is a completely different operating model and completely different organizational structure. So this, this change and leap is not uh, easy, but if you think about it, when you think about it architecturally and structurally, it actually is doable. And then finally, commercial governance can give you a um, way of uh, approaching it across your operation, across your customer base, and across your organization. So if I had to leave you with three thoughts, uh, to, uh, if I had three thoughts to leave with you today, it would be, you know, we speak a lot about API first. Um, I would challenge you one step further, go monetization first, because you're working hard in creating these APIs. Think about how the, those APIs are going to be governed commercially, and you will drive those commercial results the way that you intend to. So start with your prioritization layers. Focus on not what an API is, but what an API does. And then think about your commercial governance, and think about the developer, partner, and customer behaviors that you're trying to drive with, that, with those layers and with that commercial governance. And finally, evaluate how you might do a contributor revenue uh, model in tracking the incremental revenue driven by your uh, API products. My final thought, there are many, many ways of doing this. What I just presented to you is one approach, uh, you know, with the naming conventions and such. That's not the ultimate way of doing this. What we say all the time is the right way for you to build this is one that you can most successfully implement and execute. Like, look at your successes, look at the strengths of your company, your ecosystem, and that will guide you in terms of which parts of these governance and architectural approaches you can borrow and you can most successfully implement. If any of this is interesting to you, uh, please find us, find me at Esra at pricinginnovations.com and let's continue the conversation today and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>